thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to teach your word, to hear your word, to learn of you. That uh, history has its lessons, and that we would we would learn from these historical events and the spiritual principles that they illustrate so well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, quickly, write down for me the first three ages, church ages, according to the seven churches of of Asia in the Book of Revelation. The first three church ages. Give me their names. Can you give a date with them? Some dates with them. So we're going to key in on the third one just a little bit. What went on there? How how this is? We're going to see this in operation here. David's writing great gangbusters. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> one done? We got there, Marty. Asia the Apostles? Yes, Asia the Apostles. I'm just going to write Apostles. <coughs> 30, 30 to about what, folks? 100. 100. Okay, good. Sure. The death of the Apostle John, the last living Apostle. Only one not to be martyred. Okay. Our second age, Age of the Apostles. Age of Martyrs, yes. And we like to, and uh, it's better to call it, you're right, in Imperial Persecution, Second Age, from 100 to 313 AD, because during the Age of the Apostles, people were martyred for Christ. And there have been martyrs in every age. But during this age, ten Roman emperors took aim at the church and persecuted it. So it's the age of imperial persecution. So, and let's see, that this is the church, or this is Ephesus, meaning desired. God desired a church like that, or you can interpret he desired the church in 100 AD to return to the first love that they had in 30 AD. You could interpret that being what he desired. Imperial persecution was what's our what's our church name that goes with that, folks? Smyrna. 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 It means myrrh, which really means bitter. It's a time of bitter persecution for the Christians. And then our third age. What do we got, folks? Oh, I'm not kidding. Uh, Pergamos. And what we call it, it's uh, Age of Constantine, often, Pergamos, often called the Age of Constantine, or sometimes called the Age, I'm going to give you the other name for it, Age of Councils. There's a church of different councils which formed church doctrine during that period, also called the Age of Constantine, from about, from 313 to about 600 A.D. When we said Pergamos, means what, folks? Mixed marriage. Mixed marriage. Sure. Or thoroughly married. And it speaks of the marriage of the church and the state. We are going to look at a, at, at a Christian bishop from that period. Please remember that the church has authority from Rome not just to exercise religious power, if you will, in the church but actual civil power. And so, and we said this was a bad marriage. It was a bad marriage. So we're going to watch an operation here. The bishop here is Nestorius. And he's known for the Nestorian heresy. Born somewhere in Syria. I don't know where all exactly it's here, but yeah, he's, in, he's there. And, let's see. Uh... He died in Egypt in 451. His date of birth is not known. But please remember, 
this age of church and state, who? Uh, yeah, really, 313 is good. Also, 3, 325, the first church council, is evidence of this. The Council of Nicaea. Because at that council, the emperor called the church council, he umpired it. So we can see the operation. But really, once once the church had its freedom and, and was no longer had imperial persecution, it quickly became part of the <laughs> Roman political structure, unfortunately. So, we have a bishop who's after this period. And, you know, he dies in 451. It's a good deal after. There's, you know, when he's born, probably, this structure of church and state together has been operating at his birth probably 60, 70, 80 years already, and will continue there. So it says he's, he was living as a priest and monk in the monastery of Eupresius, near the walls, when he was chosen by the Emperor Theodosius II to be the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now this is interesting. Who makes him the bishop? Who appoints him? Books. What's it say there? The Emperor. What? The Emperor is now appointing bishops over cities and regions? This is what I say. This is kind of like asking the president of the state to tell you who's going to be the head of your congregation or the head of your denomination. It will be the same kind of political structure. The political leader is appointing church officials. Now, when he does this, I'm sure he, 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 he you know, took advice from different uh, other bishops in existence at the day, but the emperor calls the decision. This is a red flag. Whoa. <laughs> He has no business doing this. All right, A group of bishops should meet together and make such a decision, not the emperor. So that's the first thing we say. We the emperor is in the church's business now. Now, watch what happens when he becomes the, the bishop. Let's see. Bishop of, let's see. Let's see. Constantinople. Now, a little bit about Constantinople. We haven't talked about it much. But it is modern-day Istanbul. But in history, it goes by four different names. So when we're doing these things, sometimes you're going to see these four different names. Uh, if you will, its original name was uh, Byzantium, then New Rome, then Constantinople, and today Istanbul. But Constantine made this an Eastern Empire or center for the, for, the, for the Empire. And it had a very large church there, a very influential church. So this is where he's appointed. He's not from Constantinople. He's from the, he's from the Antioch, the, the church in Antioch. But he was brought here. And I don't know exactly why the emperor chose this man. There's different reasons. But he seemed to be a good speaker and very zealous leader. All right? So we're going to move ahead here. He had a high reputation for eloquence, and I, they think that perhaps the emperor was thinking of a former leader who was the head of the church in Constantinople, Christensen. And he was from Antioch, that this would be a repeat performance. So he's consecrated in 428. So the year now is 428. Uh, he, is a, he has been made bishop of this region and this great city by the emperor. And things seem to go well at first. I'm going to watch the cu first couple of things he did to show you what's, what's going wrong. He lost no time in showing his zeal against heretics. Well, how did he show his zeal against heretics? Within a few days of his consecration, Nestorius had an Arian chapel destroyed. Red flag. What's wrong here, folks? Is this how we promote the gospel? No. No, something's wrong. We're supposed to love our what? Enemies. We're supposed to win people with our testimony and our words and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not using political power to destroy their chapels. Okay, now, he is accountable before God. And I don't think God is pleased with this at all. 
Now, we're, we're going to get into some scriptures on this, but this is a bishop who's supposed to be, you know, who's supposed to be represent Christ, and instead of winning the heretics, persuading the heretics, preaching against the heretics, he's signing orders to have their chapel destroyed. Okay? Now, now we see the thing, if they did not have political power, could they do such a thing? No. Now, but being that he's appointed by the emperor, he not only has power as, as head of the church, but he has civil authority. And he's exercising it zealously. But this is, this is a, if you will, a different way to spread the gospel. Not the recommended way. Not what Jesus said. Then let's see what else he does here. Uh, then he persuades the emperor, Theodosius, to issue a severe edict against heresy in the following months. Well, you can pronounce an edict and tell people this is a heresy. And that's wrong and don't do that. Okay? But he goes to the emperor to make that edict. So again, he's relying on the state's power. He had the churches of Macedonians and the Hellespots seized. I mean, he took churches away from some group that he considered to be heretics. He just took their property. All right, this is what's going on. And then, uh, I don't even know who this, what the, all these groups represented, but they're different heresies. The Quadrodecimans. I haven't even checked them out yet. There's so many of them. I, I get crazy and I'm looking them all up. And then also says he also attacked the, the Novateans in spite of the good reputation of their bishop. I don't believe this was an army that attacked. I believe he verbally attacked this heresy, which would be proper and right to do. Okay, But not with an army. Not seizing church's properties, not destroying church property because they disagree with you. Now, interesting enough, during the age of the martyrs, what did the Christians complain about? You arrested us, you persecuted us, you put us to death, you took our property simply because we were what? Christians. So now in the next day, we're going to take your property simply because you're Arians. Oh, the same thing they preached about a hundred years ago, they're now doing. Okay? And people seem to be blind to this because there's this church-state unity here. Something, the church... Though so this is not the Catholic Church yet, this is not the Roman Catholic Church yet, but the church has gone astray from its mission already. It's very lost in the way it's carrying out its authority. Things are wrong already, very wrong. Now, this is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why Rome fell during the, I think it was first sacked in like 425, about 425, I don't know the exact date, and then again, it, it was invaded around 465 or something, and, and, the last emperor was gone. But it's during this time period. Well, what's the church doing? Not what it's supposed to be doing. And and the empire that's supporting that church is going to go down. There's, there's, there's cause and effect going on here. Most historians don't put these two things together. The church has lost its way, not doing what it's supposed to do. And, and God is not blessing it. So, let's look at a few scriptures with this here. Oh, by the way, this group, give me an idea of some of these... This, this was a, a big heresy, and, and it does have to do with church history. I will mention, we'll throw this in here, the, the Novateans, okay? Now, Novatean was a, was, a, was a bishop in Rome, and I'm just going to be real quick with this. His position was this. During the periods of imperial persecution, there were Christians who didn't want to have their heads chopped off or their bodies thrown to, to wild beasts or be burned at the stake. So they, you know, they drag them into court. They say, are you going to worship our God? Yes, I'll worship your God. They go back and say, can I go back to church now? <laughs> I'm still a Christian. I just want to die. <laughs> and the Novatians said, no, you can't come back. He says, no, we will not accept your penance. So he said, wait a minute. You've got to forgive these people. Yes, you do have to forgive these people. So there was a split in the church over those who said, those who bended the knee and compromised or in persecution, they said, no, they should not be let back in the church. But the, the majority of the church and bishops said, wait a minute, <laughs> we have to forgive these people. Christ forgave our sins. This is a forgivable sin. We have to let them back in. There was a split over this. All right? Now, some of you know churches that put people through steps of penance and 
And you know, I I I, I won't go in, but I've been places where actually, you know, if you sin in a certain way, you, you could not walk in the front door of the church and use the back door. People would do such things. And and you know, discipline, church discipline can get crazy. But anyways, uh, this was going on. So if you see the Novitans, oh that's the split who left because I didn't want to let people come back in the church when they buckled under persecution. Anyways, there was a lot of different groups. And you know, often we think, well, you know, Catholics will say, you know, after the Protestant Reformation, the church was all divided up into all these little groups. I'm reading about all the heresies that went on before that. There was a whole lot of dividing up before the Protestant Reformation. There were all kinds of groups splintering off for different good or bad reasons. And more than, oh my goodness, I, I couldn't even keep track of all the names in different groups that, that split off from the from the, the main body of the church and the, and the main body of doctrine. Now, so we have this. Uh, okay, we're going to leave them for a minute. Back to Nestorian. Nestorius. He too is rigorous in his. And we're going to see what he's up to. He's rigorous in his application of commanding orthodoxy. I mean, he's using civil authority left and right to persecute anybody who disagrees with the church. Now, look, now the scriptures stand against this man. What does it say here? Uh, okay, this this, well, this gets into his doctrine. I'm, my slides aren't quite where I want them here, but this one. The Nestorians did this, and this is actually hard to understand, and I don't think I quite understand it. But what they taught is Nestorius taught, let me erase this, I'll put it up here for you, as simply as I can. Maybe I shouldn't have talked about the Novatins. <laughs> Get you off track here. Right. Let's see. Orthodox Christianity, the and particularly the Western Church. Western Church, by this time, particularly influenced by Rome and the Roman bishop. If you read different historical accounts in the 4th century, often the Bishop of Rome will be called the what, folks? Pope. The Pope. That's a Catholic view of him. Now, that's not my view of him, and he's not officially the Pope yet. Okay, neither is he infallible yet. He, by the way, Catholics did not declare the Pope infallible in, in, in writing anyways until the 1800s. Yeah. But as far as he power he, he he exercised. It was as if he was long before that. But anyway, the so Bishop of Rome in the Western Church, their doctrine was correct. Here's what it had to do. It had to do with the with the uh, with Jesus. And it had to do with his dual nature. And the position of the church, and it's still the position of Catholics and Protestants today, and it is sound. This they got right. Is that Jesus has in his one person our two natures. He has a human nature. What's his other one, folks? Spiritual. Yeah, or you could say, I just say divine. Divine nature. Okay? So, in one person, we have two natures. That is very important because uh, we need that for our forgiveness. I mean, it's true, but it's also it works this way. When Jesus shed his blood to pay for the sins of man, Jesus had to be a man. For that blood to take our sins away, it had to be the blood of God. So his deity and humanity both are very important to our forgiveness. So, you know, he, he, when he sheds his blood, it is the blood of man, but it's also the blood of God. He's divine and he's human. He has two natures and one man. Now, <laughs> let's see if we can do this. Here. Uh, yeah, I've got that up there. Jesus had a human body. So, the, the evidence, Luke 22, 42 up there, is one of those scriptures that supports it. If he, he says he's praying to the Father, he says, not my will, but thine be done. 
Because he has a human nature, he has a human will. Now, he is a sinless human being, but he is human. <coughs> and one of the things about being human is that you, uh, a thing called avoidance of pain. Do any of us recognize that? Oh, yes. <laughs> ah, it hurts, don't do that, don't touch. <laughs> no, I'm going to the doctor, it hurt last time. <laughs> now, is that because we're sinners? No. That's because we re re <coughs> human beings react to pain by doing what? Avoiding it. As I always say, pain is a great teacher. Mm. So, Jesus in his human nature, does he want them to drill a nail through his heel bone? No. Oh, no! No! Ah! Okay? That's not because he's a sinner. It's not because he's a coward. It's because he's weak. It's because it hurts. And when something hurts, a human being wants to get away from that pain. He's a human being. He's experiencing human pain. He has a natural reaction to it. Not a sinful reaction. So, do, 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 I want to, do I want to have my back ripped open? No. Do I want to hang naked for people to stare at me? No. Do I want the presence of God to leave me when I'm on the cross? No. Do I want to become sin? No. Do I want to please the Father? Yes. Yes, and I'll do it. So, here we have him as a man in his perfect humanity submitting to divinity. But he is both the Son of Man and he is the Son of God. So this is a very, and this is a mystery, but this is exactly what the Bible teaches us. He would say, if you have seen me, you have seen my Father who sent me. I'm an absolute deity, but I'm also the Son of Man. All right? And people say, well, how does that be? I don't care if you understand it or not. It's in, it's in the book. <laughs> it doesn't mean we're going to understand it. We just see it. So this is this is the correct doctrine. Now, where did Nestorius get off from this thing? Uh, let me race here and find this. When I was a young Christian, I said, you know, Jesus had it easy. Of course he didn't sin. He didn't have an old sin nature. And then I started realizing that God put him through things in his physical body where he had denied himself, just like I have to deny myself. Because his human nature did not want to do it. Not because he was a sinner, but because, you know, he was asked to do things that went against his perfect humanity. Well, anyways, it's an interesting thing, but he, he lived it. Thank God he did what he did. So, uh, let's see. I have to go back here. I think I've missed him. Let me see if I'm missing this one. I think I'm missing one. Let's go back here. Missing. There, I gotta get this slide for you. Let's see what's on. This is what I skipped. Okay. I got oh I'm missing a slide I'm looking for. I have to just put this on the board. Let's see if Alright, I moved something. Okay. Alright, let's do this then. Here's his position, I'll put it for you. Uh, Nestorius believed, and this is what I'm going I'm to just I'm to qualify. Believed that there were, in a sense, two persons in one body in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when asked about this, he says, no, that's not what I believe. But this is where it gets interesting. Whether he believed this or not, this is what he was persecuted for, and this is what he was banished for, even though he said he did not believe it. Now, this gets very interesting. So the question is, was he a heretic or was he not? I think he was a real Christian who was trying to explain the, uh, the dual nature of Christ in a little different way, and the church jumped on his case. If you will, kind of a witch hunt. But wait a minute. What did this dude man do when he became a bishop? He went on witch hunts. And now guess what? The church goes after him. This is what's really going on. Spiritual principles go on in these people's lives. Now, let's look at what goes on here. 
In James it says, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Did he show any mercy to the Arians? Did he show any mercy to those other groups when he confiscated their chapels because they disagreed with them in their theology? No. Nah. He, 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 they had, he gave them no civil rights. Destroyed their property, took their property, okay, used his authority to civilly persecute them. And Jesus said, remember, you know, if you live by the sword, you shall die by the sword. That comes from Matthew 26, 52. As a bishop, he is living by the sword using civil authority to persecute others. He disagrees in an area of doctrine, or seems to disagree, and he is banished. And there was a church split over this. The Western church in Rome was not affected by this. They held to the Christ was one person with two natures. But the churches in Constantinople, Alexandria, and Antioch, three powerful churches, argued over this thing and seemingly forever. I don't want to go into all the things they said and did to one another, but they were divided over this thing. They couldn't seem to get it right. The church seems to be, you know, lost its way, arguing <coughs> over things that perhaps are not worth <coughs> arguing over instead of preaching the gospel and winning souls and building each other up in Christ. So, churches will do this today. If you look at the splits in major denominations, often they're over things that are an embarrassment. This is nothing new. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. So, when they call this person in before a church council, the historian says, no, I don't believe this thing. And he tried to explain himself, but his explanation they would not accept. And I did see one quote saying this, I don't think he's a heretic, but the way he's teaching this thing is heresy. <laughs> so here's what was going on. During this period of time, Mary, the mother of God, was slowly being elevated higher and higher in the eyes of people who she really was. The church was beginning to call her. She was, in fact, the mother of Jesus. So she's the mother of Christ. And he said, that's fine. But there were bishops calling her the mother of God. And the story says, you shouldn't do that. And he was trying to say, what he's actually trying to say is, his human body died on the cross, but deity can't die on the cross. No, no, that didn't die on the cross. Only his human uh, humanity died on the cross. That's what he was actually trying to teach. And they were like, no, 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 Stories, you got this thing wrong. <laughs> so it was a, it, it's not quite clear what's, what's going on, but that's the, the crux, as best I can tell you. So I don't want to spend more time on this thing. The point I wanted to make is when churches exercise authority that they should not and do things the Bible tells them not to do, they get themselves in trouble, and God's grace to a degree is removed from them. This man is unmerciful, and he's not getting any mercy. So, to not make the same mistake, Pastor Moore is very good about teaching this in our church. We may disagree in points of doctrine with many of our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we still what? We love them. They're still in Christ. Some of their doctrine, some of their doctrine may be heresy. It doesn't mean they're a heretic. Okay? And we need to love the whole body of Christ. And and this is this is God's this is God's will. Defenders of the truth, yes. But not persecutors of her brothers and sisters. This man was doing this to the nth degree right away, as soon as he becomes bishop, and then he's gone three years later. Exiled, banished. Things went poorly for him after that. He really suffered. He, where he, he went back to the monastery where he was, and then he got uh, some uh, rotting band of thieves, took him captive, and when he returned to me, he had broken ribs and broken hand, and it just did not go well for him the rest of his life. But this is what it was over. 